My name is Greg Garabrats and I'm President and CEO of Axos Financial and Axos Bank. And I'm panicked about our ability to take advantage of all the market opportunities that are arising as a result of all this recent dislocation. Jensen. Yes, Mr. Linsen. Where's the intern? Intern is right over here. I'm here. I'm the intern's here. in for a treat. We have a real professional on the phone. Now, some of these, like, fake guests that I, I conjure up, you can take the mic back. You know? We're like yeah. an old factory here. We should get this kid a mic. Yeah. The, um, I'm going to get right into it. People are up in arms. There's a little bit of panic. I, myself, um, had a tough four days. You know, venture capital is very hard. Sometimes you have to work on the weekend canoe. Ooh. Yeah, and uh, and the interns, you know, they're not available. They're out golfing, uh, mowing lawns, trying to make ends meet, and there was a bank run. Supposedly, there was a bank run. Right, I heard something about that. And it happened, luckily, I, I was off the internet for three days. I didn't know it existed. But it existed because, you know what? Other people called me. And um, so I, I picked up my phone, and the first, you know, four CEOs I called were out of business. <laughs> so I figured, <laughs> go to number five. And uh, no, the first uh, person I thought of to talk to is, is an old friend of uh, Social Leverage. His uh, chairman of the board is one of my dearest friends and mentors, Paul Grimberg, who, uh, you know, let's go right to the list. Let's go to the CEO, Greg Garabans, living in San Diego. So I asked Paul if it's okay to call the CEO because, you know, we're in a in a banking crisis. But who better to have a CEO of, of a bank that... Uh, survived without taking TARP way back in the old great financial crisis. And now we won't talk to people that took TARP. So I hope I got my facts right. And um, because that's when I was an angry uh, vigilant. Mm. Uh, We do forgive Greg. He worked at Goldman Sachs. But um, he has shared the secret handshake in the past. And so he gets a pass for that. It's generally, uh, it's not uh, safe for work, the handshake. And uh, so can it? No, you can't see it. And um, he's president and CEO of Axos Bank. Okay, and then that at one time was called Bank of the Internet. Um, I remember sitting about, I don't know, four, five, six years ago when they're doing the change. I'm like, really? I love Bank of the Internet. And that's why I don't have marketing anywhere in the country. And uh, they're a federally chartered savings institution with approximately $18.4 billion in assets. Nice. So he's busy, Knut, so let's yeah. get Greg quickly on the phone here, and let's just talk about this current crisis, and, and as he said on the show, this is like an opportunity for CEOs like this. When the markets move this much, and your bank isn't in the crosshairs, uh, so let's get Greg on the phone. Sounds good. Greg? Hi, Howard. How are you? Thanks for taking the time. This is obviously... Maybe since 08, one of the most interesting few weeks in in financial recent history? I think that's true. So tell me what it's like. What goes down on the venture capital side of my world where I live in? uh, Accusation flying, everybody's an expert. But in the end, this was a a bank run. So tell me how this plays out in real time at Axos. Yeah, well, so with respect to our deposit base and the the nature of how we built it. We have about 12% of our deposits that are uninsured and we have quite a diverse deposit base uh, that looks much more like a retail bank with uh, with a wide variety of, uh, of depositors. And so we really don't have that ecosystem effect that uh, I think came up, right? And so I think if you would go back and ask weeks ago, would anybody be running screens on the percentage of uninsured deposits of financial institutions? I think I was not asked that question <laughs> in the last 10 years. We asked that question internally, but wow, hadn't heard it. And if there was a screen that the Fed set up, like, you know, in a world of software, is, should the Fed have a, just a, a mission critical screen that they're eyeing into on banks? Is that a stupid question? I'm going to ask a lot of stupid questions because I, I come from the venture industry. Like it seems like if 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 Silicon Valley Bank 
there were bloggers out there in Wall Street Journal last year kind of reported slyly, you know, what the problems were. But it took Internet in real time to tip this thing over at record speed. Is there some kind of dashboard that banks and the Fed should be sharing so this doesn't happen? Well, they do share a dashboard, yeah. and that dashboard is uh, has a lot of different metrics. But quite frankly, the two metrics that weren't really – well, at least one metric that wasn't on the dashboard, at least from a, to the extent that I haven't heard people talk about it, was the percentage of uninsured deposits. And then the next one was this concept of AOCI, this uh, this impaired – capital that occurs as a result of securities revaluations that does not have to be realized but is presented in the financial statements on an unrealized basis. So being diversified obviously was a benefit. You know, I got the I got the advantage of calling Paul and you on the weekend and saying, "Can we explain to our founders quickly and sure like we you you quickly prepared for us stuff for our uh, both our LPs and and for our banking and for the benefit of you know hundred plus portfolio companies of ours how this how this insurance work what what didn't young kids know and what should they know about uninsured and insured and you know what's the biggest lesson here right I think the reality of the biggest lesson is that. I don't think there's really much reason at all to take uninsured deposit risks at most banks, particularly at the level that a lot of companies did at Silicon Valley. I mean, ultimately, if you want to be an unsecured lender to Silicon Valley Bank or another bank, you're going to get paid, you know, in this market, quite a bit of money for that. Maybe you'll get paid 6 or 7%. You're just not paid for that risk. And there are tools, such as the tools that we talked with uh, with with you and your portfolio companies about, or some of your portfolio companies, that allow you to consolidate your banking relationship and have full insurance. And so, where does some responsibility like again? Let's let's see if we can't rewind the clock. So so going forward, why? And again, I think this is partly the VC fault, uh, maybe the most, which is you're handing out fifty million dollars. Uh, and a growth round to a venture company that has no CFO or no treasury management, is it not someone in the bank going to call that founder and say, listen, you're sitting with $49,750,000 of uninsured deposits. Is there no responsibility there? It's still kind of, like, How did this all happen from the bank side? Right. Well, it's interesting. I think in Silicon Valley Bank's case, the way that they had done it before was they pushed those deposits off balance sheet into a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. and then so they, they were doing that just magically? Well, no, I think that what they would do when they set this up uh, back in the day um, before they decided to balance sheet all this, because they went from about 70 or $80 billion of, of asset footing and then only 18 months or two years grew to $210 billion which is extraordinary growth. And almost all that growth was not the result of lending or uh, or any kind of asset side activity. It was all the result of just having a lot of cash flood into the, to the startup ecosystem. And then their decision really, the fatal decision really there was to invest in very low rate long-term government bonds. And in the end, that is kind of the it wasn't some crazy, crazy trader. That's the investment or the balance sheet that did them in. Right. It was if they had simply kept those treasuries short from a duration perspective, they could have sold those treasuries and uh, and paid off the depositors. The bank might have shrunk from two hundred twenty billion down to one hundred thirty billion, but that wouldn't have been meaningfully different because it wasn't as if they were lent out on the lending side against those deposits. They simply had mismatched the duration, and then those were obviously liquid securities. They were just liquid at $0.80, cents, $0.75 cents on the dollar. And is there any lesson in here? This is going to be another dumb question, but there's a lot of questions I get asked by LPs. Is, so why are banks public? Obviously, it's, it's obviously access to capital, but why, if if the Fed can't, keep track and they've got to step in and guarantee deposits, what's the point of having banks that are public? Or is it just impossible and banks have to be public? Well, I, you know, I would say that it, I don't think it's really related to the fact that they're public or not. I think 
that what I mean, maybe what you're referring to is the idea that when a public stock deteriorates for whatever reason, that results in a a, a crisis of confidence among depositors, particularly if they're a concentrated set of depositors that all talk to one another, right? Um, if you were at a smaller bank or if you're even at Axos, we have a wide variety of customers. They're not all reading the same trade blogs. They're not all uh, listening to Peter Thiel. So it's just a it's a very different structure there. So I don't really think, though, that, that that's necessarily related to the idea of being public. No, I meant like, you know, from a layman's term, the I deposit money or startup deposits money. The bank doesn't want to pay me 2% or 3%, so I take the money off balance sheet away. And the reason maybe the bank, like Silicon Valley, doesn't want to pay me 2% because they don't want to miss their quarterly number. I'm saying, like, is it in the public's best interest? Is it worth trying that, like, you know, banks should be private companies so that management just manages the bank and doesn't worry about quarterly numbers, or it's just impossible? You know, I don't... I honestly do not think in this case that this was too much related to the idea that they were public in the sense that, frankly, a, the a public market should be able to recognize that because it's very clear from public filings what your securities balance sheet looks like. And so I think this simply is a broader issue and it is the result of decades of more than a decade of very loose monetary policy that's resulted in investment decisions that a lot of companies now, if you look at if you look at banks and you look at Charles Schwab, for example, they have hundreds of billions of dollars of securities that are incredibly underwater as a result of the duration and the uh, and the low rates in which uh, they were invested. Correct. You have to assume they were all in that trade. Yes, I mean, mo a lot of war. Now, I mean, I know this sounds self-serving, but I wasn't. We didn't do any of that, and and I sold every bond that I had in my personal portfolio, and the company has next to no bonds because I simply didn't see that any kind of carry trade that you know would give you 1.5% for 10 years had had any real upside, and it obviously had an immense downside. And I think I think people had focused so much on the credit side after the last global financial crisis mm. that I really do think some of that basic asset liability management stuff just um, got a little bit lost. Yeah, I mean, maybe the, I know it's not this simple, but maybe I can't get fired for, uh, you know, they got me for lending to my dog in the last one, but you sure. can't get fired for buying a 10-year T-bill from the government. I, th I think there was a decent bit of that. I think there was... A, a focus on credit risk to the exclusion of other risks that, uh, and I just, I also think that there was a genuine belief that I would often hear that there is no way the Federal Reserve can raise interest rates beyond a certain amount because the fiscal situation in the United States is so tenuous, et cetera. So I don't believe that, I, I don't think I'd meet too many people that would have thought that you could get a five year you know, Fed funds rate in the time frame that you may get it in. That just that just wasn't really something that a lot of people thought could happen. Now, when you sit with Paul and you talk, were you like to each other going, I can't, but the, the Fed's going to break something here. Isn't that what a great CEO, sh even if they're not acting on it, should be able to just see by being a CEO of a bank saying this, you know, I'm sure the Fed maybe knows what they're doing, but at the same time, isn't something going to break? And is that what led you to get out of bonds or is it just... Like, should you have to have that kind of nuance? Because that makes it hard. Well, I think in fairness, um, you know, I predicted the last uh, 10 of the last two rate cycles. So so I think, you know, you can always argue, and there were those arguments, that we were uh, simply not maximizing our earnings because we had all of our liquidity in in, uh, in very Deposits, short duration. At, well, yeah, we had it just at the Fed. We just right. put our, we earned less 25 basis points or less for years on that liquidity. And so you can argue that if we had, if we had taken a little bit of uh, duration risk there, we would have earned, you know, an extra percent and a half a year. I guess the, then the question is when you give it back. But, but I think there is a broad question that is in some cases, bank CEOs 
rise up through the ranks often as the best relationship manager and salesperson and things like huh. that. And they have yeah. other people who do the investing. And that's not really what you need at a bank. You need to have somebody with a very strong investment oriented mindset. Yeah. And you came up through the ranks doing that before. So, well, kudos to you. And what, how is this different than 08? I mean, it's obviously way different. You know, back in 08, I was angry, maybe because I didn't have money and I was just angry that uh, <laughs> people were getting bailed out. This doesn't feel like a bailout, but everybody wants to call it a bailout. This feels like, hey, man, I, you know, I don't think you can ask a depositor to understand insured, uninsured, you know, who's got a small business with $350,000 in the bank. How would they know this? So where, where, is this just lead to more expenses for you? And like, what would be a dream scenario? Because you can't educate your way out of this, even though we'd like to, to believe that. Yeah. Well, so I, from a dream scenario perspective, I think clearly there were uh, important ecosystems that were served by Silicon Valley Bank. And sure. I think that, that, right, that absence is going to require a Silicon Valley Bank 2.0. And whatever that looks like, um, I think there were a lot of uh, real wonderful things about what Silicon Valley Bank had built. And so, you know, to the extent that we're going to be able to try to figure out a way to serve that community, I think that our entrepreneurial nature, our tech forward nature, all those things should be good cultural fits there. And, uh, you know, ultimately the fundamentals of what Silicon Valley Bank did with respect to serving that ecosystem, uh, you know, I think was very valuable. Uh, you know, the bond investments in some respects are almost a sideshow yeah. with respect to, you know, the underlying nature of what their business was. Yeah, they were good at doing business. The bond, you know, a department brought them down. I mean, I don't know who to blame. Like, I don't want to get into the blame game, but like Silicon Valley Bank, it built a great brand. Everybody liked them. But behind the scenes, uh, two dudes with a bad Excel spreadsheet had duration problems, which just seems, you know, so simple, but it, it can't be that simple. Well, the, uh, I, I heard, uh, I forget who told me this, but I thought it was pithy, but I can't, I have to attribute it to this unknown person. They said Silicon Valley was the best $70 billion bank and the world's worst uh, $220 billion hedge fund. <laughs> exactly. I mean, in the end, trading brings these things down and it's always bad trades and it's easy in hindsight to just see how obvious that was but you know when rates went negative i mean what were people thinking like i just don't understand it and then when rates went to three four percent on two years i used to tell people in my industry i'm like guys these were zero you don't want to take safe money at four percent you're also nuts so the pendulum just switched when it did so fast so as a diversified bank so let's say you have 18 to 20 billion in assets right yes and so you're diversified between consumer, business, securities, RIAA. How do you decide, do you lean into one or two, or is there some new category or geography that matters? What we try to do always is we try to put out products that we think make sense in all seasons and are conservative enough to survive the type of crises that we saw in the global financial crisis from a credit perspective. We put those products out through our channels. And then often um, we succeed. And then at times competitors come in and they and they take share from us. And if they're taking share because they're uh, loose on credit or the loose on structure, we let them have it. And it's uh, and it's interesting because then more quickly than not in this in these days the market lets them have it. So on the mortgage side, for example. You know, we lost market share in our single family business over the last couple of years mm -hmm. to people that were doing 375, 30 year fixed rate mortgages. We don't do any 30 year. We lost that market. But now all those guys, those conduits are pretty much all out of business. So that happened really quickly. And then that opens up the opportunity for us. So I think it's just the steadiness of keeping standards through cycles and then Sometimes you have to accept that you're just not going to do as much business in a particular area until the irrational competitors get pushed out. And so now we're at that point. Uh, and today it's, you know, uh, First Republic Bank, whose equity is basically trading for all intents and purposes at zero. So it's a little over my pay grade 
you you wake up today and you you open up your portfolio or sorry your stock screen or whatever app you use and you see it at twelve dollars is that for all intents and purposes over you know what i what I do think is that let me put it this way I like think they're thinking through how to restructure this like the depositors are safe based on what yeah um, the Fed has said but like you just leave it up to the government here and you just forget about it well, I think if you have uninsured deposits there, you obviously have to think through that. I mean, obviously, the question is, is even if you're 85 or 90 percent sure, I guess the question is, you know, why would you take that risk, right? right. Back to my original question. But That's I, that original asymmetric com- risk. Why would right. you take that risk? Right. But I think, that, I think that what you do see by the types of firms that invested in there, that there probably will be some sort of potential... Um, you know, potential deal probably coming out of that if I were to, you know, prognosticate what what will happen there. But I think that the fundamental issue there was that you, again, had a business model that was very interesting. You had incredibly good credit, and I still think that credit on that loan book will hold up incredibly well. But you had uh, folks that basically said, we're going to give you a super, super low mortgage rate if you do all this nice stuff with us, particularly if you hold a lot of zero cost deposits with us. That trade seemed like not a bad trade when you could get 25 basis points maybe on your deposits uh, somewhere else. But now if you can get 2%, 3%, 4% on your deposits and you're holding that money at 0% on a, on a, uh, yeah, you know, a good faith basis and you have a 2.75% mortgage that is seven year fixed, that gets to be a very different model. So even if the deposit model survives there, you then have an earnings issue. Right. Because they're never going to earn money for the next decade. Right. You have to, you, you can't have those fixed rate loans. And, and you see the trade. So if you have loans that are 375 and are, are, you know, five, seven, 10 year fixed, they're trading probably in the $80 price range, maybe 80 flat, 82, 83. So that means, and that makes sense because you're basically accreting that discount in over the time frame. Mm-hmm. of the fixed period. And are you underpaid because the Fed's going to come there and, and beat you up? Like it, the regulator is just going to be a regulator now. They're going to be meaner and uh, crankier because someone's yelling at them. So how how ugly is it going to get? Well, I think the question is, is where, where are you in the crosshairs yeah. with respect to the elements that they're going to be paying attention to? So I think that oh, that's good if point. you're, Right. If your business model is super concentrated in something and you have a lot of uninsured deposits in those, uh, those concentrations, I think you're going to have a lot of, uh, a lot of explaining to do. Right. So frankly, what we're doing is we have clients who are telling us, well, you know, we feel really good about you and we know mm-hmm. what you do and we don't want to take your insured product, which is a, a product that just, all it simply does is we you tell us where else you bank and then we place those deposits at those banks and you still get access to all that money through us. You know, we're really trying to convince you to take that product. It cost us about 14 basis points, which is frankly why Silicon Valley never did it. But if Silicon Valley Bank had just simply used that product um, and they uh, and they had put their clients in it, then I don't think they would have had a bank panic because they could have told their they could have told their clients, hey. 150 million secured, and if you had more than that, take it out and put it somewhere else. Correct. Right. I mean, it's just like basic math. Right. So, and then on the Fed side, I mean, you can't comment on this, but the fact it seems like I'm reading the past year, the SVB had been under scrutiny and had already received several warnings. Again, like the people that are mad at, at the user, the dumb depositor, I just, I mean, obviously right. I don't know what's true, but I mean, if the Fed can't figure this stuff out. Yeah. It's sort of interesting, right? Because part of the problem is is that when you when you basically make a bond investment like that and then rates start to go up, you're kind of in this interesting situation. And so yeah. then, you know, once you once you kind of pick that poison, it's very difficult, right? Because there's no real way around it. And I suppose raising a lot of equity um probably would have been, you know, the right approach or going through and saying um, gee, I'm going to start really working on insuring my deposits, right? And I think that would have been something that would have been possible. And so for lots of people are saying, listen, in my industry, it's like, get your money, you know, unfortunately for me, 
it was all podcasts and people yelling on Twitter, and it was like, Jim Cramer, you got to get your money to J.P. Morgan. Well, who's he talking to? Because most of these small businesses, they won't even touch you, right? Um, right. So where, what, what comes with this now? So lots of people are just going to yell, get your money to too big to fail banks. Right. So first of all, what do you think of that strategy? And what can a smaller bank like Axos offer that too big to fail banks can't? Like, let's right. go through yeah. that. Well, so I do think that that is a very legitimate concern uh, among if you're a, if you're a typical community small um, business bank or something, and basically you get a situation where uh, a signature bank at let's say 120 billion dollars, and the government steps in and says, "Well, these are too big to fail." Well, you now have a line. You know that what's bigger than that is too big to fail. So certainly, J.P. Morgan is too big to fail. In case you didn't know that. And so why bother with anything below that, right? And I think that that kind of, that kind of mindset, I, I do think, will be, uh, may, may temporarily uh, kind of move money from some regionals. I think that with the downside of it is, quite frankly, is they're going to pay you nothing for your deposits. They're not going to lend to you. If you have anything difficult to explain and you need to talk to someone or have any understanding about your business whatsoever, you're unlikely to get it unless you're really big. And um, and so then the question is, what we can offer is we can say, we can offer that same security through our insured cash sweep product so you have no uninsured risk, but you get all the other benefits, a better deal, higher rates, lower fees, uh, more uh, tech-enabled service that is custom-made to your particular needs, a banker that you can talk with who can understand you. In certain cases, we can lend. Depends, obviously. But I think all those uh, are the things that we offer against that. Yeah, and you've been doing So let's just walk back. Great answer. Um, I've known you forever. So what was the year you took over as CEO? Uh, 2007. So 2007, some, somebody saw what was coming and said, hey, get that Greg guy. GFC's around the corner. Let's stick it on <laughs> him. So what the hell? Let's just flash back so people just have some context. How old were you in 07? Oh, uh, gee, I was about 35. And Paul, my friend, was on the board, I guess. Grimberg? Yes. And so you get voted in to be CEO, and a year later, the GFC happens. Now, right. no one was spared in terms of stock price, and uh, you guys never had to do anything drastic. Um, what the hell was that like? Well, it was interesting because it was actually, honestly... It was wonderful for us. And the reason why is that, so it was interesting is, so I had come out of Goldman and then I had gone to a regional bank and I was, um, and I was supposed to help diversify that regional bank. And so they were a very mortgage heavy shop and I got to see, and I got to sit in the committees and look at what they were doing. And then I was working on the uh, multifamily lending standards and we started a multifamily lending business. And you know, we got that going, and, and and it was a couple billion dollars of of originations, and so, but that was so small relative to what uh, what this firm was doing, and so I remember looking at this and saying, you know, this is not going to turn out well. So when I when I came in two thousand seven, I started positioning the bank immediately. For example, we had an RV lending group. I shut it down within a, within a week. And you didn't have branches or still don't? We didn't. I shut down the RV lending group. I stopped lending on home equity in uh, in, in the three sand states. And uh, we started positioning our portfolio. We went out and raised some capital. So frankly, we were we were ready for what happened and we were able to take incredible advantage of it. It really helped catapult the institution in a way that, you know, I don't know if I would have been able to do what we did uh, without the benefit of that dislocation. Yeah, so this location, I know you and Paul probably are trying, but this is the opportunity, as, as, as horrific as these days are. The same with my business, is like you get through it, but at least it cleans out the, the riffraff. Right. And so, so tech now, so I know you and I always talk about tech when we get together and what the bank should do and the stuff that I'm seeing in fintech. Now we've gone through this kind of fintech, I, I, you know, I, I say Mark Andreessen at the top because, you know, it's not their fault. That's just the, the way the system works. You know, they were saying everything is fintech. And I was like, oh, God, no, that's not true. 
And here we are now in fintech companies, even more than most are down 90%. Now you have the banks imploding. So how does, how do you think through tech as a bank today? Are there opportunities that, that Axos could buy companies or is it more integration on top of your APIs? Cause you guys have been very focused on your API. Yes, I, I think there, those are all potential opportunities. I guess I'd categorize them kind of similar to what you say. You know, we have an open API architecture that can work with fintech companies. I think with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know, not being there, I think that's a really good opportunity. If if you if we have fintechs that want to work off of our payments platform, I think that's a great opportunity to to mm -hmm. do that. Um, if there are companies that fit within our ecosystem, we can buy them. And uh, and then obviously there's also talent on the street too, and we can hire that talent. Yeah. And what is that look like? Is, so, like? is it as easy as, you know, the HR person goes to LinkedIn or is there something more complicated than that? Because there's that many people from First Republic, let's say, or you know, some of these banks that are just completely from 100 miles an hour to zero miles an hour and they're getting their resumes up on LinkedIn. Right. Well, some of it is uh, some of it is as simple as going on LinkedIn and calling people we know and, and, and talking to people. There are possibilities that maybe as part of the resolution process, there will be pieces of that business that come out. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if that will happen in a way that is just something we could do, but it's possible. Yeah. Well, how big is the bank? How many employees? Uh, Axos. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, so we basically about 1,200, but if you include, we have about 450 uh, developers that are contractors offshore that supplement the workforce. And that's pretty big given, you know, the amount of technology we develop so that, you know, that, that's, that's a significant part of the employee base. A couple more questions. So I'd love to get your thoughts, if you can, on crypto, when or even if mainstream banks even if they wanted to get involved after the Silvergate collapse, because they were also a local bank, I think. Like, uh, Axos is a San Diego headquartered bank. Silvergate was a, a bank in San Diego. What, what are the takeaways on the highest level? So I think that there is regulatory scrutiny that's probably disproportionate to the risk right now, uh, actual risk in crypto, because of what's happened with Silvergate, but I'd also like to differentiate the ecosystem of, uh, of crypto in some ways that I think are relevant. So if you look at, let's say a crypto mining company, that company, they may mine crypto, but they're essentially a set of, they're a data center that basically acquires power and, 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 and does a, uh, an activity, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that risk of that account is actually relatively small. And if you have a corporate account for that, that mining company, there's really not a lot of risk there. If you're, uh, you know, dealing with institutional accounts and you have an ability to track the transactions, that's um, that's something different. I think I think the toughest accounts are the ones that deal with consumer funds, uh, particularly international funds, and trying to figure out the right way to uh, to deal with those accounts. Yeah, I look at it like cockroaches in many ways. They're, they're digital cockroaches, meaning we can make fun of blockchain. We can make fun of the scammers. We can make fun of crypto. Uh, and in the U.S., they may make it harder and harder each day, but it ain't going away. Right. I think that's right. And I think that it, it's not, it's always certainly you never want to have regulators step into a place where they're attempting to, absent congressional legislation, dictate the way an industry should uh, should ultimately whether an industry should ultimately exist or not. So I think that the regulatory framework does allow, um, you know, good quality companies to uh, you know to have access to banking, and I think that's an important component of of obviously what these companies are trying to do. So you know I think you just have to look at this on a risk. Uh, on a risk-based approach and, and, and make sure that you're appropriately diligencing the companies and the accounts. And it's just unfortunate that it got tarnished with the whole FDX debacle because I think that really did paint a, uh, a picture that I think is not really fair to the rest of the industry. Yeah, I mean, in hindsight, he's a 20-year-old kid and they treated him like a god. So we set ourselves up with that one. So as a, as a public bank CEO, 
you know, the numbers here that I'm seeing have grown earnings 15% a year for more than a decade with an incredibly strong ROE. What are the tricks to do that? You know, is it just, you know, sticking to the basics? So you haven't put the bank at risk. You didn't take TARP. The company's not in trouble. Phenomenally strong. And so how do you measure that with also keeping the regulators happy? I mean, those are the two big issues that you have to drive from the top. Right. So I think that how we were able to achieve this is that we've continually incubated new businesses and business lines that are counter-cyclical or don't tend to uh, to have problems together. So if you look, for example, I'll give you a, a simple example from just last year. We made about $50 million in the mortgage banking business uh, selling uh, loans uh, when rates were low to Fannie and Freddie. And clearly when rates rise, that business gets a lot more difficult. But we coupled that business with an asset management platform that is uh, very benefited by uh, interest rate increases. So we're making about $50 million more on the asset management side per year. So, you know, I think largely it's coupling those businesses together, having enough diversity of your platform so that if you don't want to proceed down a route where you see it getting frothy, you can basically scale that back and make those decisions. And I think a lot of, a lot of banks, they feel like they're so embedded in one sector or they're so committed to one thing that if it starts to look frothy or strange, they don't feel like they can back off from it. Hmm. And, and, and the key for you is being able to back off. Yes, I think you have to. I think you have to be willing to say, that's not always easy because you're telling, you know, a great salesperson, you know, in multifamily, for example, you don't get a seven or 10 year fixed rate product ever, right? And they say, well, my competitors have it. I need to have it. My customers want it. And you say, well, you can't do it unless you're uh, willing to, you know, uh, buy it on a swap basis and swap it fixed to floating. And the clients don't want to do that. Yep. And, then, and then you have to convince them that don't worry, when the next rate cycle happens, you'll be really happy you're not unemployed. But you have to have those conversations and you just have to be real about it. And, you know, those those have their consequences, but the consequences of not having those conversations are worse. So is this more, in your opinion, macro the event that was just out there lurking, or is there a crisis out there amongst some of these banks that we don't know? Well, I think right now, um, but the way I would describe what would happen is something like this. It was liquidity, then earnings, and then potentially credit. And it's interesting because the liquidity side, if you look, is nobody's been paying attention to that percentage of uninsured deposits. And now everybody's paying attention to them, and there's also the right. dynamic which you stated about why why not be at the biggest bank that just simply can't fail? So that that dynamic I don't think is over, and I think it's going to play out, frankly, through diversification. So for us, what our plan is, is we're going to take a piece of it, right? Then, then the next uh, piece of it is, if you survive liquidity, but you have a bunch of either uh, underwater securities or underwater loans, and you continually have to reprice your deposit base, then you have to deal with that. Right. So then you have to deal with that NIM compression, net interest margin compression. Um, and then the question is, is what are assets worth if interest rates stay high for an extended period of time? And that's, I think that's the big one. Yeah, it, it is in the sense that, you know, when we when we look at um, it's always interesting. That was another topic of discussion. Often it was, well, what is the exit capitalization rate that you need to be able to lend at essentially what's the debt yield meaning when this building if this building operates and you needed to take it back at your debt level what return could you offer to folks and you know a lot of the uh, certain of the lending didn't have that debt yield high enough so I think you just have to pay a lot of attention to that to make sure that you know you're lending at a place where the loan would be attractive to someone else and so with all the rescues in the US that are in the process of taking place and with the UBS Credit Suisse, where, where do you see the industry going? And then I want to just ask about one specific, but where do you see it going? Obviously, you've weathered a couple major, major storms, and this is about that, I guess. It's a, it's a fat tail world in banking. No one, no one talks about you until they need to talk about you, then you're blamed with everything. Um, 
how, how do we get through this and where do you see the industry going? You know, I think that we will, I th it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be any congressional action with respect to the question of essentially creating an environment where the perception, and I think frankly it's accurate, is that there are too big to fail banks and that therefore you should put your money with those banks. So I think that's going to be an interesting question. I'm not hopeful, just given the nature of the relative lack of um, ability for Congress to come together and address issues of that nature. So that's going to be an interesting question. But absent that, I think the industry will uh, continue to focus on um, making sure that they have a larger percentage of of insured deposits. I think there'll be an increased focus by bank regulators on liquidity, particularly focused on that question. And um, and I think you'll you'll see a significant reduction in lending appetite over the next uh, period of time as banks kind of sit around and assess what happened and uh, try to figure out how they should move forward. Have you met Warren Buffett? Uh, no, I haven't. So that's interesting. So your plane then was not seen. <laughs> there was people on Twitter reporting, you know what it is. It's like, oh, the planes were all attaching Warren Buffett. Is it, uh, you've never gone out to one of his conferences and just worn a silly hat and just cheered on the old fart? Uh, no, I haven't done that, but uh, it might be fun. I've heard they're pretty interesting. I, uh, I did meet Charlie Munger in an elevator once. I was uh, working uh, as a summer in turn, and I held the door open for him. And as he hobbled through the elevator, I literally moved my hand back uh, immediately. And he said, well, get on with it, will you? And close that door. And uh, <laughs> so uh, he was, uh, it was he, yeah, it was, uh, it was, yeah, he was definitely <laughs> kidding, but it was, uh, it was pretty funny. That's the closest I've come to Warren Buffett. And who do you look up to in this industry? I mean, to me, it seems like if I'm you and I'm not, um, I'm like every time I see that white-haired prick from uh, J.P. Morgan, I'm like he's your Newman. Who's your Newman, <laughs> and who do you look up to? Who do you see on TV and go Newman like Seinfeld would do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I've uh, I've I've gotten a chance to to meet Jamie Dimon a few times only through conferences and listen to him speak and at a couple of dinners, and I think he clearly, I mean, from a standpoint of a of a of a CEO that you really can be impressed with. I think he's it. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a, I wouldn't say it's a Newman thing. I'd say that, uh, I'd say that any chance you get to watch, um, uh, a master like that at work, you got to take that opportunity and, and, uh, and recognize, uh, excellence when you see it. So, and that's, I think he's pretty excellent. And then is there any people in the banking industry beside him you look up to and it's just say like the North star type thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, but they wouldn't be, and they'd be individuals that, you know, shared particular insights about particular areas and less someone that you you look at and um and say, gee, this this is everything together. Because I think that a lot of people get a lot of things right and I, I think the question is, you know, how you bring those things together, right? And it's so it's so easy to to look at an S V B now and say, Well, gee how horrible it all was, right? But the fact is, with a lot of these things, there's a lot of great stuff, right? And sometimes, you know, you you you're not focusing on this decision, or you're 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 letting your treasurer do something. And, and obviously, I, I'm not going to make excuses for it because it was a it was a pretty big a lot of doing something. But yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. there's folks there's folks that I I look at across the industry who have done something interesting that I admire. The, the the industry that interests me most, and I think you're, you you can't like make any one big bet is, but I as a VC, well, not a VC, I'm a seed investor. The one area that just so interests me is wealth tech, meaning that the money that was printed, whatever wasn't just pissed away over the last eighteen months, um, if if we are in a bear market, it's going to deteriorate at a slower pace, meaning the froth is gone. So this money has to be managed, and so to me that's like. Hate it, love it, hate the Fed, love the Fed. The point is the money was printed, it's out there. Um, the rich are rich. It seems to me the no-brainer business to be in is wealth tech. Is it a big enough money to move the needle for a, a regional bank? 
Uh, I think wealth tech is super important, and, and and in our own way, we've tried to enter it through the RA custody business, which we purchased. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you know the uh, the robo advisor that you've introduced me to the the second phase of that is that we're going to basically uh, take that and attach it to our RIA platform so that it has the ability to allow any money manager or any RIA to basically place their model within that robo advisor so that those individuals can serve clients that they might not otherwise be able to serve just from a standpoint of their business models, uh, you know, efficiency. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in wealth tech, and I think that um, it, it can be done in partnership with registered investment advisors who are also looking for solutions uh, to, to serve their clients and to figure out a way to serve clients that may not be of the size that their typical uh, business model works for. Yeah, because my, you know, full disclosure, um, I'm lucky enough to have that problem, and you'll meet some of the founders that we've invested in, but personally have that problem. And, you know, where I'm at First Republic, and they clear through Pershing, right? right? So it's all off balance sheet. Yes. And so they, that's a prized business of theirs. So that, uh, those LinkedIn's will be firing off, but that's a prized business. I don't know if it moves the needle for them, but that is a rock solid business. I agree 100%. I think that clearly... If you're trying to figure out what the most valuable piece of that business is, uh, my personal belief is it's clearly the uh, the wealth management side of it by far. Well, I'm excited to spend the way you are uh, lucky enough for us going to come out and talk to our founders just at, our, at our yearly meeting and all of our emerging managers. It'll be 800 to 1,000 companies at Axos will directly and indirectly get to uh, speak to on all this. So I'm glad to get a dry run with you for... Uh, uh, my wife who listens to this and maybe Paul uh, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully everybody at Axos Bank. But is there something I miss? Because again, I'm not steeped in banking. Like my banking is, uh, I mean, I love Axos because Paul and because you never took tarp and you just guys just go down the middle. Plus you're in San Diego. I'm super bullish on San Diego. Am I right there? Like, yeah, I think so. I think, I think the city has uh, has a good future. Uh, you know, obviously, you got to get governance right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think you know there's there's some homeless issues downtown and things like Ooh. that. But I think in general, it's um, I think it's it's generally uh, still pretty good. And I think you'll see a little bit of backing off in home prices here, but nothing that's uh, that you know that would back them down even to where they were a couple of years ago. So no, it's a it's a great place to be, and. Uh, and I and I think I think the reason to uh, to to like Axos is that we do very very low leverage asset secured loans with uh, with lots of very uh, large funds behind us in the uh, BPs who uh, who are great partners for us and and help uh, help us make sure we manage to uh, not have any losses because they want the underlying assets if they uh, if, if the borrower is uh, not interested in, in, in fulfilling their obligations. So, yeah, well, I think we have a great model and I think it's, uh, I'm excited to share it with, uh, with your, with your founders and your, and your, and your team there. All right, my man. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I'll let you get back to uh, the mess that is interest rates. Is your take like personally as someone who, who, sees rates like is it is it from a macro perspective i think they persist up here whatever the fed does you know for the average person looking to buy a home is there never a bad time to buy a home and you shouldn't worry about interest rates you know you've got kids yourself like what what does someone on the brink think about that yeah that's an interesting question i i do think that you know whether we get another i think we probably get another 25 but i think it's going to be a really close call and then i think the fed's going to hold up here for a while I do think that this um, this turmoil makes it less likely that they'll be as aggressive as they would. I certainly hope so. Yep. Um, with respect to the question on timing of homes, I do think there are places that uh, are likely to have declines in home prices. I just think the question is, is as somebody who sold their house in 2007 and was renting in the hopes <laughs> in the hopes of being able to buy something out of foreclosure, which I ultimately did and got a good deal on it. It took a long time. Yeah, it so take a time, so yeah. it was three years of uh, looking and uh, having my wife irritated at me over the fact that we had babies coming and no house. So, you know, I think, look, I, I, I would say that right now I wouldn't think it's the best time to buy a house, quite frankly. But, you know, you have to judge that, you know, with respect to your own 
uh, your own, uh, you know, desire to consume versus weight, right? And I think, I, and I think, frankly, where you are in Phoenix and a few other places, I think you're going to see, I think you'll see some opportunities. Yeah, it's been resilient, my man. It is, Phoenix has blown my mind. You know, I left town, came back. Uh, it took forever for prices to get back to those 2006 to 2008 numbers, and then we just, we haven't looked back. Not at all. with this. It's really an interesting town, but uh, Phoenix is a growth market. I mean, I know the summer is, but this Phoenix is, Phoenix has evolved. It's a much it is. more robust, um, it's not just real estate people. No, it's and, true. And uh, it's getting better. And the, the economy underlying it is getting better all the just time. Just so, so strong. I hate being that guy, but it's so strong. Well, I appreciate the yeah. insights. I'm going to let you go. Uh, we will see you uh, soon. Greg Barabance, thanks for doing this. Hey, thank you. Take care, Howard. Knute, Howard, he laughed, unlike the whoop guy. He laughed. The Newman thing can't go wrong when you say Seinfeld. He works in a very serious business, and at times he's got to be very serious. But, you know, he laughs. He's got a great sense of humor. But during that, he, he texted me that my accounts have been closed for one of those questions. I don't know what question it was, but he just said, your, send me your wiring instructions. You're out! <laughs> the the thing is, when you know Paul, so so Paul's been kind of a mentor to me and... and uh, been a chairman there since uh, the dark ages, but um, these are not growth companies, you know. These are uh, to be run by professionals. Yep. Um, we just learned a big lesson over the weekend. Uh, so anyways, hopefully that helps uh, calm some people. I yeah, mean, we're I not recommending so anything. We're recommending that you understand your banking products, and, and it is your money, and you have to understand how SWEEP works and FDIC insurance works. And uh, do you need to understand the balance sheet of your bank? Uh, if you're going to own a stock, maybe. But I think the Fed has said, listen, if you're a depositor in America, you're going to be you're going to be backstop. I wouldn't uh, bet my life on that, but I'm saying you've you've gotten a reprieve to learn some lessons about insured and uninsured deposits and who you bank with. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed that. This is Panic with Friends. Uh, we talk with bankers when there's crises, but in general, uh, we talk to venture capitalists. Uh, dreamers, uh, people trying to look around corners and get a little bit ahead of the market. Panic with friends, search it on the internet uh, or search my name, Howard Lindzen. You may be able to soon be able to search Canute Jensen and, and have something show up on the internet, hopefully. Oh, yeah. I haven't tried that. Every Thursday we drop one. If you subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or um, uh, Fox News, I think, or CNN uh, <laughs> podcast app. Do they have a podcast app? You will uh, get some mean intro and someone yelling at you and calling you woke and still be able to uh, subscribe. Anyways, see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of social leverage or stock twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast.